It's Matthew Rich. You survivor's guilt I had and a feeling like my story didn't matter and so it was very cathartic to tell it and then you know the reception to have people say yes this story matters has has um, you know been personally really fulfilling. Um, was it uh, you know it's, uh, obviously we've seen some very successful films in the past few years, like you, you mentioned about uh, documentaries dealing with uh, right. uh, stories of AIDS in San Francisco and New York and other places. Um, did, did those kind of films help this film be able to get made, or was it as much of a struggle to make as uh, well, it was, one would imagine? Though, I was making it while those were already in post-production, so there wasn't a direct influence there, but I, so I think it was more of a zeitgeist thing. I think enough time had passed that people were willing and ready to tell other kinds of stories. I think we were ready to tell Party Glances and Longtime Companion in Philadelphia right away. That was the feeling. And I think more time had to pass for, for other angles and nuances to emerge. Um, in terms of the difficulty of getting it made, what was difficult to get made was a bigger budget movie that was more commercial that I spent three years writing and optioning and doing that whole dance, and after the discouragement of that, I just said, I'm gonna write something very personal, I don't care if anybody likes it, you know, the, it's, it's a, the great old story, you know, you just do something because you really want to and you have to, and, and I wrote it to be a, a small enough budget that I knew I could raise the money, and I knew I could just make it, and not give all the power away. To Los Angeles. <laughs> Los Angeles. Um, well, uh, let's talk about uh, it as a, sto a story of um, a story of San Francisco, and um, you know, obviously, getting that time and that place, the '80s, but also you know, kind of getting San Francisco um, right. I know that people in San Francisco representation very important. Are they here? Um, <laughs> they're very quiet. <laughs> but I, you know, how much of a, a challenge was that for you? Obviously, you're working with a, a, you know, not a not a big budget, but you made it look and feel to me like very authentic. And Thank you. Um, the first draft of the script was set in New York, and I was in New York at that time. So, for example, that headline um, on the streetcar should gaze be quarantined was the New York Post on the subway. And transposing it to San Francisco for the next draft, San Francisco where I live and where I knew I could raise the money and, and shoot it, um, was delicate in the sense that I, you know, I had to do a little bit of research and make sure that certain things would reproduce there. But you know, in, in, the, in the big cities it was a, a comparable experience, I think. And in terms of the logistics of doing period, the thing there was just, you know, we, I, we're, you're never supposed to say your budget, I don't know why, like if there's a distributor in the audience, they're like, oh, I'm not going to buy it, it's too cheap. But um, it's very small budget, and the trick was just designing all your shots, and 
and making sure you never saw a car. It's all about cars. <laughs> That's all it's about is cars. Because their clothes are easy for the 80s, right? And we had one, we had one shot, remember from the Cowell Theater, the big wide shot, where we scrambled and we got three picture cars and we parked him in front and he walks by them. But the rest of the time, camera's pointing up, pick your locations, look out for satellite dishes, go. <laughs> 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 Uh, well, I, I, I'd love to pose a question to, to some of your collaborators here. Um, I'm curious, for each of you, had you had experience with, um, with, uh, with stories of um, with people with H dealing with HIV AIDS, and, and in what way did you guys do research on the period to, um, to kind of add your own truth to the film? Um, well, I haven't really artistically before um, dealt with that, but... Um, talking to a lot of friends and people who had lived through the period, obviously, watching the documentaries, reading the textbooks and all that stuff, um, is basically where I started, yeah. Matt, by the way, is a great actor. And <laughs> he, is, he is such a pleasure to um, Because every take you would give me, like, new choices. So for every shot, you had, like, five or six choices of how to cut Matt. That's just an interjection. <laughs> um, well, I was very young during the period, but I grew up in New York, and I trained at the Ailey School. Um, so very much remembering just sort of in my memory, like that fear and that paranoia of that period. Um, so I could kind of relate um, as a spectator more, but I think that um, Chris and I really collaborated in terms of the content with the choreography and how that should feel um, with framing the male body. So that was where I sort of come in, um, came into the process. Um, and we bought a lot of art books of Egon Shiva <laughs> and looked at his paintings, which gave us inspiration for some of that erotic yet morbid imagery. <laughs> it's interesting too, because I was born um, the summer of 81. And <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I came out to my mom when I was 15 and the only thing she said to me was I don't want to see you get sick and that really kind of <clears throat> stuck with me and kind of really <laughs> as I'm talking about it now in therapy like put like a huge <laughs> damper on my sex life in a way I mean I just kind of e even though I was you know born in 81 I still kind of grew up with the fear and I mean, when I was a kid, the sex education was like rampant, and they were constantly like, hammering it into your head every day, every week, and they would have speakers come, people who were um, positive and had AIDS. So it was kind of always, always um, in my face. So it was, it was somewhat easy to draw on that fear. Obviously, not the same thing, but it was that was kind of my way in for me personally. Yeah, I mean, sex and fear were always already intertwined for you growing up. That's really. I mean, and powerful. And Chris, my editor, <laughs> and I had no, he had no experience. In the <laughs> but that was actually really useful in the editing room yeah. because there were all kinds of things that he wouldn't get, you know. And we, and that caused us to add lines or add scenes. In fact, the whole scene where Walt tests positive, and that was an idea where he leaves that voice message. That was an idea we had in the editing room, right? And I did a reshoot. But also just things like when Walt said, when he says, I thought it was something we should try, the condom. And we had a take of Walt saying, um, it? it was something different. It was something different. And then, anyway, the point is that there was a time when everybody didn't use condoms <coughs> was news to Chris. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's something because like Matt, you know, it just goes, just that, that yeah. bit of difference in our chronology means you comms were introduced in your you know life and they were always there. Yeah. Because they'd gone away with a pill for those pretty much, right? Historically. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to open it up to the audience. I'm sure people have a lot of questions or comments about the film. In the back. Yeah, that was that was. I was, I was yeah. How did? Oh, sorry. Was, how did you cast such fantastic 
dancers and, and dancers who could act or actors who could dance. That tricky thing is that sort of the heart of the question. Yeah, that was a real challenge, and you know I didn't want to do the Natalie Portman double thing. <laughs> and um, I also didn't want to have not real dancing. So that means you have to get dancers who can act. You can't really get actors who can dance. So for the lead, that especially. So I just did a, spent a lot of time interviewing dancers in San Francisco and you know filming them. I, dancers I'd already seen dance on stage. And then when I found Scott, these were people who had no, he had no acting experience at all. And we lived nearby each other, and we spent six months workshopping the script and developing the scenes together. And I taught him acting technique, you know, and he picked it up really quickly. And um, I think does a really, really strong performance. And I'm hoping he continues. I'm encouraging him to drop dance and act. <laughs> <laughs> I just think I don't know. Um, selfish director. Selfish director. No, we're we're and. Um, and then the other dancers, there were some from San Francisco Ballet and Joffrey, and you know, I just got dancers I liked, and then I auditioned which ones could speak. Matthew's an actor's actor who's done, you know, plays on Broadway, and, and he's done all kinds of stuff. He has a long resume, and he was somebody who could move from musical theater, who knew how to dance, in, uh, and, and, and we sort of folded him into the mix with the ballet dancers. And I think he fooled everybody, he is valid. Well. <laughs> right over here. Uh, thanks a lot, that film was uh, uh, great, and I, I was happy to enjoy it. Um, given the moment that we're in now, what do you think are the possibilities for this film at this point, right? The AIDS crisis is ongoing, HIV criminalization is an issue that's emerging, new prevention technologies such as PEP and PrEP, well, I mean, that's an interesting subject, and you know, we've, we've just finished it, we're just doing our first few festivals, we've done, a, and, and so it's at the beginning of its life, but when I was writing it and funding it and making it, that was something I wanted to do, was use, use the film and community outreach. I was thinking mostly with at-risk youth. Um, and screen the film, hopefully, you know, they'll like it, and starting dialogues. I think it might be easier to get kids in to see, like, a film with sexy dance than uh, Tom Hanks is dying, you know. So, um, that seemed tasteless, didn't it? Um, <laughs> So I, I do want to explore that, and I funded the film sort of innovatively. I did both an LLC, which is typical for films, and I did a, what is it, 501c3? That's what it's called, right? And I did that as well, so I was able to get grants and private equity, and uh, the nonprofit part was, the idea was to have an educational future. So I'm not sure how that will pan out, but it's definitely something I'm interested in working on. Um, thank you, first of all, all of you for doing this film. Uh, I have to tell you, it was a very personal memory. Of many of us in the room lived through that period like you did. And the soundtrack allowed me to have feelings that I was trying to sit on top of so I could watch the film. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about the choices of the music, the Romeo Void songs, the, uh, the, you know, the Jimmy Somerville songs, and those kinds of things. The question is about the music and, and how you chose the music, which, which is so evocative of, of, a, of a certain type of period in the 80s. Music was really important, and when I wrote the script, I wrote the songs in. I wrote the Laurie Anderson in, and she's awesome. I emailed her early on because... Who is her partner? Is it David Byrne? Lou no. Reed. Lou Reed. Lou Reed. <laughs> and they're connected to the modern dance world, so they're on the boards of various companies. So through my dance connections, I was able to get an email to her, and she gave me that song for free, so it was in the script. The other songs, as anyone who's worked on film knows, it's all about budget, and it's all about music licensing. So it was a real struggle to get, I, you know, you recognize Romeo Void, and, and that's awesome. Originally, I had Billy Idol and, you know, really big names. So not being able to afford those forced us to search for really evocative 
songs that were maybe less well known, and it was probably better for the film in the long run because it's not a cliche, but it's still very 80s. And then for the score, it's Kerry Torgerson, who's a great composer, and I just wanted to give him a shout out. Yeah. He great, that great sound that sort of Giorgio Moroder, Angelo Badalamente, is that the name? And uh, a little bit like the Drive score, uh, that mm -hmm. composer as well, so using those synthesizers. Question. Right here. Well, I just, I, I, I loved it, and I just wanted to... Are you the director of Concussion? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, I loved it, um, but I didn't phenomenally love it until the last scene, when I phenomenally loved it. Oh. <laughs> because, to me, it was the time, the vodka of the time, and I'm a big TV music fan, and like Jim, I was sitting there in trance, and captured it so beautifully. I, I can't believe how, how much it I thought it was more about a comment than a question. But the thing that was so great about it to me is that it telescoped into the future mm. at the end. Can you comment on that? I mean, that it's commentary of what will we be. Right. Would you want to repeat that? Well, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a I guess, Stacey is saying the film sort of telescopes into the to the future, and and I, I guess I would add on to that is you know how, how did you come at that ending because it um, you know in a, in another film that could be made they you know they they both could get sick and, and die and, and <coughs> someone might do that as you know that would that might be what was more representative of the larger populace. How did you yeah. come at that? Um, um, I'm glad you like that, Stacey, and now I want to see Concussion. I haven't seen it, so tell me where I can see it. Um, yeah, well, that's how it came about. I, I mean, I always had in my mind when I was writing the script that test was a metaphor and that there would be three of them. And the three tests were the understudy goes on, and I put that in the middle of the movie to disrupt the structural cliche of always having it at the end. And then the second test was, of course, the test. And then the third test is the test of monogamy that, um, that was the future that came very directly out of the AIDS crisis. I guess we can't fuck around anymore. We have to settle down. Monogamy's good. We're getting married. You know, it all happened <laughs> you know, 30 years. And I'm all, I'm all for, obviously, equal rights. It's an important issue. But it's also interesting the way that came out of that. And as Matthew's character says in it, it is, you know, one way to be sure. Um, and also, before we answer another one, and I don't want to forget that to mention two people. One, Daniel Marks, the DP, whose family is here, but he isn't. And, uh, and maybe some of you don't know, making a film, especially a smaller film, is really, uh, in many ways, all kinds of collaborations, but for me, daily, in addition to the actors, it's me and the DP, side by side, planning every shot. He's a huge talent, he was a student of mine at Amherst College, and then he graduated, and then he went to grad school, and I snapped him up while he was still affordable, and um, he just did an awesome job, and he's a great guy. And the other person I want to mention is my beloved executive producer who's in the audience, Elizabeth Pang Fullerton. And she came from, from uh, San Francisco, and she's a big dance lover. She found the film on Kickstarter and contacted me, and then has been with me since. And um, it's just been a terrific support of this movie. So sorry, I wanted to get that. No, by all means. Questions, right here. about the dance spaces, how you came by the dance and spaces. And if they were separate. And if they were separate from the actual dance spaces. And also, was there choreography left out? Was there choreography left out? <laughs> I was surprised at how much made it, actually. Um, it all pretty much made it in. In fact, it repeats. It repeats. Yeah, yeah. with different music. 
Um, the dance spaces, one was Jogan Studio in San Francisco, and the other was the pier. There's actually a theater on the end of that pier in Fort Mason. Mm -hmm. They were separate spaces. I wasn't sure in the editing. I think we weren't sure if people would read the studio as part of the pier. I've never actually asked a big group. Did the studio, with all the lights, read as being in the same building as the theater? No, no. 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 <laughs> we were never sure. So, yeah, they were two separate spaces. I have a question. What was, you know, this is a sort of fairly standard question, but you know, there's a lot of challenging scenes in the film. A lot of, you know, tough things that you, you get, both of your characters have had to experience. I'm mean, curious what was the most challenging um, for you as an actor in this part. <laughs> well, the sex scene was nerve-wracking, but of course we had it very easy. Um, I think it was just the chemistry. I think the chemistry thing was interesting because we didn't want them to necessarily immediately know that they were going to sleep together by the end of the movie. So it was this kind of back and forth of, you know, I called Scott right away and was like, well, you know, I get in this day and let's get together and have lunch. And, and Scott's kind of withdrawn and shy, which is a great thing, you know, and ended up being working beautifully for the, for the film. But so it was kind of this weird back and forth push and pull. And at what point are if, we friends? If, yeah, at what point are we friends? At what point, <clears throat> if ever, does someone start to really like someone or start to almost fall in love with someone? So it was kind of mapping that out for myself was kind of probably the biggest challenge. And how to go about that. And we did put the sex scene on the last day of the shoot. And, yes. And so the first kiss was a first kiss. Right. And it had suspense because you built up a relationship. I, I really like your chemistry together in that movie, and I hope you stay together. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm not sure they do. Does that mean there's a sequel? <laughs> Retest. <laughs> right in front of um, It's not really a question, just thank you so much for making the film because it's really wonderful and beautiful. And, uh, you know, I have seen Party Glances a million times and Longtime Companion, and I love those movies. Um, but I think your story is really important, especially for people my age, because uh, it is about prevention and staying healthy, and, you know, it's a different reality now. So it's wonderful to have a story that doesn't end in a really tragic way, and you don't leave it feeling even more frightened than you started watching it, so. Thank you. You're welcome. It's the old Harvey Milk line, right? You gotta go home. <laughs> I see Bob Hawk. Bob Hawk. Matthew, uh, I know you as a dancer on Broadway, and as uh, a straight actor <laughs> in uh, <laughs> Desert City, <laughs> but, um, Many Broadway dancers, um, their training is wider, like in modern dance and all that. And I just wondered what your training was and how how much you had to work at adjusting uh, what is primarily Broadway dancing, jazz dance, and modern dance. Well, my body doesn't show up, but I was in dance class every day and doing Pilates and ballet. Um, no, it was, um, I mean, once I found out I got it, I immediately got into dance class and kind of got back into that. I mean, I've never been a strong technical dancer to begin with. I'm, I can be very stylized, but my technique was never always my strongest point. So um, it, was, it, was, it was a little stressful and nerve-wracking being around company dancers. But, you know, Chris and I talked early on, and Chris was like, so... Since you're gonna play the part, let's have him be like on his way out of the company. He's like, oh, well, we're, you know. so we kind of, <laughs> and I was like, okay, great. So I don't have to be as skinny, and I don't have to be as good as everyone else. That's, that's good. In the first draft of the script, that character was like the young virtuoso. Yeah, he was like the best and, so. and I think this is much better. You it is. I think it makes more sense with the character and kind of his journey and the relationship. But um, but it was. It was challenging. I mean, it was challenging to get back into ballet, which I hadn't done since college, and which I loathed with a passion. So it was like, really, you know, but Sidra is so fantastic. I mean, I remember my first meeting with her, I was so scared, and she probably remember this, and she's so chill, and like, she's just like, hey, what's up? So it was like, but I don't know, let's do some stuff. Like, she was so easy and cool about it, and like, 
immediately she just like started building my vocabulary through what I was already doing, yet bringing her specific quality and vocabulary into it. So it was kind of, I mean, both of you made it we so had easy. We had chemistry. <laughs> I got them together in a studio early on, and Sidra across the street. Across the street. Yeah. So and Sidra, I don't know if there's something to talk about there a little bit about how you work with with individual different, you know talents and, and, but you were really good at like finding what people were good at and. I mean, it's a, yeah, I think coming in, so the project late actually, it came in about a month before and just knowing there were going to be disparate, you know, levels and. She did all the dance in two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> so having done a lot of commissions in the past and working with very different types of dancers, and I've worked with actors before actually, um, in technique classes, so. I had that experience, and knowing that, we just kind of met halfway. But I hope that answers your question. It was just, um, it was kind of going back to the basics and, and catching up very quickly. Yeah. Hey Chris, do you want to talk about Scott, how he's the dancer to the actor? Where are you from? Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> That she, she wanted to uh, talk about Scott as a, a dancer turned actor. He, yeah, that, that, he's really a natural at it. And like I said before, I think, I think he might continue doing it. Um, I've just encouraged him to start acting classes in San Francisco just so he can continue to do scene work, you know? So he's, a, he's enrolled at ACT. I'm shocked how natural they all are at it, really. And they all are, right? Like, I'm like, the guy in the dressing room, Roy, The dressing room scene, Roy, it like breaks my he's heart. He's in John Freese. So yeah, it's, it's really like, good. It's amazing. And oh, Miles in the much. locker room. He's in San Francisco Ballet. Time for a couple more questions more. in the back. <coughs> right. This lady, right here. Um, hi. Today, hey, Megan from Mark Morris Dance. <laughs> This has always been an issue for me as an early film buff and as a dancer. Um, so I'm very aware of the history of that from Fred Astaire's dictate that you need to see the whole body all the way through balance sheet, not wanting to do TV because it cut everybody up, all the way to you know the MTV Moulin Rouge. And I, I kind of come down somewhere in the middle. I love Moulin Rouge and I and I love you know cutting all over. But as a dancer, I also a choreographer, director, whatever the hell I am. I also want to see the whole body. So I tried to have a happy medium between honoring seeing the whole body, so we're not like, God damn it, pull back, and also cutting in for dynamic, because it would feel too old fashioned if you didn't have some editing rhythm in it. It would be boring. So I tried to sort of find a better balance. Chris helped me with that. It was like a, a ten minutes of the, the original. That's right. The original yeah. dance in, that's in the middle of the movie was like a six-minute ballet with a beginning, middle, and an end. And then he was like, "We at this point, we really only care about the lead character." <laughs> 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 How do you cut all that out? So, so we, I threw it together, and then the rest of the ballet that found a place in other spots of the movie where dance comes back. So we didn't lose it. But it wasn't like, yeah. One more question. And I think I'm from the back, right there, in the structure. Strength. Yes, yes. Uh, two comments. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, Can you speak, speak up just a little bit? I was, saying, I was saying thank you. I'll try to speak more loudly. The second thing was that I noticed that if I got my math right, math you were born in 81, and you said you came out in 15. So you came out the year that Cody and the governors came out, which of course changed. Wow, I didn't realize that. Uh, my question is that you, uh, to, the, to the director, that you, you mentioned a couple of things that sort of motivated you to do this film. Yeah. And the, one, one thing that you mentioned very much in passing was survivor's guilt, uh, and another thing was the third 
test to sort of you can really do through kind of monogamy. This takes place in 85, so they're going to go through a decade of just, you know, they're going to lose basically at least half of their friends. I'm just kind of wondering what else motivated you to make this move. What else motivated me to make it relevant? This was sort of your story. I'm kind of beyond the survivor's guilt. What else motivated you? What else was sort of inside of you that made you? Well, the tone of that moment I hadn't seen captured. The fear and panic, but also, and especially in film terms, the silence. Everything I'd seen around it for obvious reasons, had a lot of talk in it. That's how you write drama, especially on stage, you talk. But for a lot of very, very young people then, who were sexual but just, it was too frightening to talk about. And my dominant memory from those dance, the dance company companies I was in was, no one talked about it. It was like someone would drop, and or someone would disappear, mm -hmm. and that, feeling of that tone and atmosphere of silence, I thought I wanted to capture it on film and I thought it was very cinematic and it forced me to write a movie with very little dialogue. Um, so that's, I guess, an answer from an aesthetic, personal point of view. I want to thank you also for, for, for making this film. It's, it's really an honor for us to have this here as a closing night film and, and I hope that um, everyone will join me in giving Chris and Sidra and Matt and Chris, Chris another round of applause.